All right, Buenos Dias, mis amigos. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about um, what this gentleman here has to say, and this is this is a big deal in my opinion. Now, the reason why there are these competing positions of a ah mill, post mill, dispensationalism, historic pre mill, preterist, and all the rest is because it is so difficult to uh, know with precision and with certainty the exact references of future prophecies. And that's why uh, the greatest minds in the church continue to examine these prophecies. We don't have the benefit of hindsight, which is 2020, and we want to be always vigilant and always alert. Uh, all right, so I can't, I can't believe somebody would be this I don't know what to say evil you can't know the greatest minds in the church can't know what the truth of the Bible is that, that's BS absolute BS all right so before we get into it I mean I wonder if these guys if they've ever read the Bible I honestly wonder you know he's if you notice if you watch this video of um, RC Sproul he's reading notes the whole entire time he's continue he's got a like a playlist or something he's he's reading from these notes and he's not reading from the Bible and then at the end of his sermon, he concludes, oh, we just don't know. We can't know. We don't have the benefit of hindsight. Now, what, what are you out of your... I feel, I feel like... i got to bite my tongue a little bit. I mean, this is unbelievable. Really. All right, so, let's... For example, in John chapter 14 you know this is a great one right here too in John chapter 4 God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth now how can you worship God in truth if you don't know what the truth is all right so in John chapter 14 oh 15 also let's just read these and let's see what happens okay even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not think about that neither knows him but ye know him for he dwells with you and shall be in you the spirit of truth so you can know but when the comforter is come whom I will send unto you from the father even the spirit of truth which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak, and he shall show you things to come. <clears throat> it's unbelievable. Let's see if I can find another verse here. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's unbelievable, man. I mean, we could go. Here, let's do it this way. Let's do it this way here. In Matthew 7. That's unbelievable. And ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you for everyone that asks receives and he that seeks finds and to him that knocks it shall be opened All right. we can know the truth it's unbelievable that this guy would say that now let's get in let's show you now he's talking about the you know Revelation 20 is what he's talking about and then he's given uh, all these different views 
<clears throat> and if you've heard me talk before, I'm against all these labels. All right. Because what happens is, like, for example, R.C. Sproul, he'll say, well, the A millennials believe this, the pre millennial believe that, and then you got the post millennials, blah, 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 blah. And then he defines each viewpoint. So, I, I got a big problem with that because he's pretending like he understands anything. He don't understand nothing and he admits it at the end of the video. And who cares about the different viewpoints? And, and maybe it's just me, but I just want the truth, man. I just want the truth. Man, okay, so let's say um, you're a Muslim, and then now as a Muslim, you're going to define what Mormonism is. You're not a Mormon. So what you're doing is you're, you're essentially setting up a straw man argument. And so also, R.C. Sproul, he presents all the, these different views, and he, it's a straw man argument for each particular view, because he doesn't believe in any of them. So it, and it doesn't matter anyway. All that matters is what the Bible says. All right, so let's get into what the Bible says. All right, so you know that the thousand year is only mentioned now how do I say this the thousand years um, oh my goodness I want to be careful how I say this the thousand years that is spoken about in Revelation 20 is not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible as a thousand year period. This thousand year period is not mentioned as a thousand year period anywhere else in the Bible. This is widely acknowledged. Nobody really stumbles over this fact. Alright. So the question becomes what is the thousand years? Alright. So we're going to get into this now. Now I want to start off by taking another angle. Okay, in Revelation, I'm sorry, in Isaiah 13. We're going to start at verse 6. All right, we're going to start at verse 6. All right, in verse 6 it says, How ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Now what is the day of the Lord? The day of the Lord is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. It's the end of the world. This is prophesied from Genesis to Revelation. Therefore shall all hands be faint and every man's heart shall melt and they shall be afraid pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them they shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth they shall be amazed one at another their faces shall be as flames behold the day of the Lord cometh cruel both with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Man, this is it's coming, man. The great day of the Lord is coming. And it's not going to be a transition into a thousand years of peace. It'll be a transition, if you will, but not of a thousand years. It'll be the destruction of all that is evil. And the transition is to everlasting life. Not a thousand years. It's forever. Okay. Verse 10. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. 
The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place. In the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger. Alright, now I want you to consider this. Verse 13. Isaiah 13 verse 13 and to me this is so obvious it's like how how do I share this with you right well, let me try it this way all right a little bit of a different way but it's the same it's the same way I mean it's this is all throughout the Bible it's amazing all right therefore I will I want you to remember this verse I therefore I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. Now Matthew 24 verse 29 immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. All right, And then Jesus appears in the clouds of heaven and he sends his angels to gather together the elect. Now we read here, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, the sun, stars, moon, and all that. But I want you to take particular notice. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and, and in the day of his fierce anger. So we go to Revelation 20 verse 11 and I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them you see the parallel right there therefore I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place and there was found no place for them you see the parallel this is Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. This is Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. And this is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. The great day of the Lord is the great day of Jesus. It's what's been prophesied all throughout the Bible many days many times many many times and it's consistent all the way through this is important I think to understand that the very first prophecy of the end of the world in Genesis 3 verse 15 and I, the Lord says to the serpent I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel his heel is the Lord Jesus Jesus is going to stomp his foot on the head of the serpent and so we read many times all throughout the Bible that he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet uh, we see this numerous, numerous times, right? In Psalm 10, for example, um, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at thy right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool, right? And this is echoed uh, all throughout the Bible. And of course, in Revelation 3, we see, Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee 
we're going to be up in the air with the Lord. Our enemy is going to be gathered at our feet. And fire is going to come down from heaven and devour them all. So this is when Jesus stomps his foot on the head of the serpent. So the, this is the great day of the Lord when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. There is no extended time period. And the reason why I think this is so important to understand is because to suggest it's not the end of the world is to essentially say Jesus Christ is a liar. I got a problem with that. If you're going to say when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it's not the end of the world, you're the liar. Because it, I mean, this is all throughout the Bible. This great day of the Lord. I mean, this is. If. Look, this is devastating. The day of the Lord is devastating for the sinner. Devastating. And Isaiah 13, it makes it. as clear as it can be it's devastating it's not well we're just gonna transition boys and girls to a thousand years of peace you'll get yourself another chance to believe in Jesus no that's not what's going I mean come on I mean if Jesus comes today it's gonna devastate your life it's going to devastate this world. It's going to dramatically affect every single person in the world. And really, you know, not just every single living person, but every single person that has ever lived. It's a big deal, man. This is a big deal. God doesn't throw these passages out just for fun. This is not just a threaten, vain threaten. You know, I'm going to get you, sucker. No, that's not it at all, man. This is serious stuff that's going to play out. And it could play out today. There's nothing stopping this from happening. And we don't know. We can't know. Is it today? Will it be tomorrow? Well... I wouldn't wait till tomorrow if you're not ready today. Okay? Now, let's get into this. Alright, so when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it is the end of the world. In 1 Corinthians 15, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, which signifies the end of the world. For the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. So when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it's the end of the world, and all wickedness is destroyed forever. Uh, so forget about premillennialism, postmillennialism, ah millennialism, buggy woogie millennialism. Forget about all them millennialisms. Forget about it. Just believe what the Bible says. Let's go back and walk through this. Wait, there's one more verse I want to talk about. One more verse. Or I'll just I'll use this in part. I'll use this in part. Okay. Uh, let's start here, I reckon. Alright, so for if we have planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. See, Jesus Christ has 
led the way for us. And we that are of Christ follow him. He's leading the way. We are planted in his likeness. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. He is the resurrection. That's why you've heard me say he's the only resurrection. And our resurrection will occur when he returns in the clouds of heaven. We will follow him. We will follow the path that he has taken. All right, so for example, in 1 Corinthians 15, right? Every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming. Right? Talking about the resurrection. Now, now is Christ risen from the dead. Jesus says, "I am the resurrection." Jesus is the resurrection. And become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, he's the first resurrection. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming then comes the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God even the Father when he also put down all rule and all authority and power for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death this is echoed again here when it says so when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Right, this is very clear stuff, right? right? For we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. We shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So here in Revelation 20, all right, there's an angel coming down. John sees the angel. This is a vision, and it talks about Satan will be bound for a thousand years. All right, now I want you to pay attention here to the. You want know, me to do it this way? This mention of the first resurrection. It's mentioned here in there here and there okay that's kind of cool all right so in verse five but the rest of the dead live not again until a thousand years were finished this is the first resurrection who's the first resurrection i just went over all this and told you it's jesus he's the first resurrection Blessed and holy is he that has part in his resurrection, in the first resurrection, which is Jesus. On such the second death has no power. Whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Right now, those of us that are born of God, we will never die. The second death has no power over us right now. We are priests of God and of Christ right now. And this is not a new thing. I mean, anybody, you talk about experts and scholars and you know, the greatest minds in the church today can't figure this stuff out. Well, maybe if they read the Bible, they'd be able to figure this out. In Exodus 19, the Lord says unto Moses, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. A kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Which goes back to give us better understanding of what this is talking about when it says, 
Satan shall deceive the nations no more. Because back here, during this time, there was just the one nation of God, where the kingdom of God was within this one nation, and outside of this nation were the nations deceived by Satan. And then here comes Jesus, and Jesus says, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bring forth the fruits thereof. In other words, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Whosoever. So the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that means there is no more just this one nation where the kingdom of God exists. It's available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. So now, again, Satan is bound until the thousand years are finished which is the end of the world which is when we are lifted up in the air to be with the Lord and our enemy is gathered at our feet so nobody left on the earth will be saved so now Satan can once again deceive the nations like he did before and of course fire comes down from God and devours them all right, and, and then of course I, I've didn't mention the compasses the camp the camp of the saints about the beloved city the beloved city which is Jerusalem which is above right the the city of God is not on earth it's above right, it should be pretty obvious and of course this goes back to um, Genesis 3 right Genesis 3 when um, Oops. Genesis 3 verse 15 where it says it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured him this is Jesus stomping his foot on the head of the serpent so back to the first resurrection we are a priest of God and of Christ and shall what's it say well, let's sit this way and shall reign with him it doesn't say Jesus reigns it says we reign with him him. Right, and there's so many liars out there, they'll say, oh, Jesus reigned a thousand years, but the Bible never says it. And, and heck, if you don't read the Bible, how would you know? <laughs> These guys are taking advantage of people that don't read the Bible. All right? And it works. Right? It works. Again, Revelation, or I'm sorry, Exodus 19, uh, you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, and then of course, Let's do this way. Get lazy. I can't even spell Peter without two capitals. Okay, who cares? First Peter chapter two verse nine. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. Talking about Christians, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy so the kingdom of God is with whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ it's available all throughout the world so Satan cannot deceive any of the nations he's sealed up he's locked up he's chained up however you want to look at it and then once once the thousand years are finished this is the end of the world and we are gathered together with the Lord up in the air. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, we are lifted up and our enemy is gathered at our feet. All right. So who, how, do, how is our enemy gathered at our feet? Well, when we are lifted up in the air, then Satan is loosed out of his prison. And he goes out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Gog and Magog, Ezekiel 38, to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea there's a whole bunch of them and it's a whole bunch of them and they're all unsaved you got a serious problem when you try to make this out to be saved people all right you got a serious problem when you try to save this thousand years is in the future because now you have to answer this question or you can ignore it and take advantage of people that don't read the Bible. And that's what they do. That's what every single one of them seems to do. Just ignore that question. 
and just to hell with the truth, right? Isn't that what they're doing? They don't want to answer that question. In my experience, they won't answer that question. Is that saved people or is that unsaved people? If you say it's unsaved people and you say at the same time the thousand years is after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, then you have to say that death is not coming to an end when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. It's not the great and terrible day of the Lord. You know, when we can circle back to Isaiah 13, this warning is in vain. The stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine, and I will punish the world for their evil. But it'll just be a little slappy, slappy slap on the wrist, and you'll get a thousand years afterwards. Don't worry about it. It'll be okay, kids. No. No, 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 no. This is a right smack in your face, man. You're going to get bopped right in the beak. And it's going to hurt. I don't know what I'm talking about. It's This is a terrible, terrible thing that's going to happen. It's going to be the judgment of God. It is the great and terrible day of the Lord when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. And we're being warned of this all throughout the Bible from Genesis, from Genesis to Revelation. It's a great and terrible day when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven for those that aren't saved. I mean, really, you can you can say it's, it's a horrible day for everybody because even though it's great that we're going to be transformed into our glorified bodies, there's going to be a whole bunch of loved ones that are going to die and die the second death. It's, it's going to be great. It's going to be okay. Everything happens for a reason, right? But the fact of the matter is, you know, as great as it is that we are transformed into our glorified body, it's equally great in a horrible way that all the unsaved people will die the second death. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. All right, and it, I mean, this is what we all wanted to know for the longest time. And Jesus was asked even this very question, What shall be the sign of thy coming in of, of the end of the world? Not just the beginning of the thousand years. No, the end of the world. And the end of the world is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. So this fella, I don't know what you want to call him, false teacher or ignorant, stupid, I don't know, whatever you want to call him, he's wrong when he says the greatest minds in the church just can't figure it out. You know, we've got hindsight and we just can't see and we're everybody's stupid and we just can't believe the truth. We don't know the truth. We don't have the truth. But Jesus is the truth and he says the spirit of truth is in us. And this is, you know, this just bothers me to say, to hear somebody say, oh, we just can't know. Baloney. Just because you don't know doesn't mean we can't know. And then the Bible is very clear that we can't know. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. So if you say, oh, we can't know the truth, then you're, by your own words, you are of the world. And you cannot receive the spirit of truth by your own words. All right, so I, you know what? That's it. That's my rant for today. That's my rant for today. I hope I made some sense to somebody because this stuff is ridiculous. I mean, it's a lie to say that we can't know the truth. We can know the truth. And, and if you want to know the truth, it's real easy. It's real simple. Believe the Bible that you hold in your hands. Believe the words are directly from God. Because they are.